Welcome to the third airing of Endoscopy Talks. I'm David Tweed from Colorado State University, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's new Translational Medicine Institute and Carl Stewart's Veterinary Endoscopy. And last but not least, I would like to thank the speakers for this Endoscopy talk series. Each speaker has volunteered their time to present these talks. So, you are, so we are very grateful to them as their series would not be possible without their generosity and expertise. So to introduce our speaker today, it's Dr. Professor uh, Phil Mayhew. He's joining us today to discuss the pros and cons and challenges of laparoscopic management of sliding hiatal hernias and gastric reflux disease in the brachycephalic dog. Dr. Mayhew is a professor at the University of California, Davis, having a focus in small animal um, surgery, minimally invasive surgery, and surgical oncology. Dr. Mayhew's main interests of research are in the areas of evidence-based minimally invasive surgery and designing laparoscopic and thoracoscopic surgical procedures. Dr. Mayhew is a graduate of the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Medicine in Edinburgh, Scotland, Scotland and is past president of the Veterinary Endoscopy Society. So with that, I will now hand this over to Dr. Mayhew. So Phil, go ahead. All right, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, okay. All right, welcome everybody um, uh, from probably the four corners of the world. This is a wonderful thing um, that we've started doing and the, being able to reach so many more people in different countries and different time zones. So uh, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about our recent experiences. And by recent, I mean, you know, five, six, seven years um, of, of thinking about doing hiatal hernia and reflux surgery laparoscopically as is the sort of standard of care in, in, on the human side, um, uh, and then putting it into practice over the last few years, because we've done some cases now, and I'll share uh, some of the results of those um, at the end. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put quite a few slides up on introduction of pathophysiology of GERD and hiatal hernia. I hope uh, you don't mind me doing that, and also talk a little bit about uh, what the surgical procedures are that have been done for many years for this condition, and then sort of uh, in the last third of the talk, uh, move towards the laparoscopic uh, treatment. Hopefully everybody will forgive me for doing that because I do think it's really important to talk about, you know, the decision-making process. Do these animals even need surgery? Is medical management a fair option for them? Uh, and lay the groundwork to deciding whether um, a minimally invasive approach to these cases or even a surgical approach to these cases is really the right way to go. Okay. So for me, this is a, it's actually a di pretty difficult um, disease process to study because it's very complex, a complex pathophysiology. It's not all that well understood. We sort of inherit a bunch of information from people, but people being upright animals, obviously a lot of differences from our canine population. Um, and then there's this whole area of medical versus surgical management. And I treat, um, I, I talk to fellow surgeons who say, you know, I've never treated a hiatal hernia in my life surgically because we just put them all on a meprazole and they all do great. Um, and that's fair to say that a lot of animals will respond to medical management, but we definitely see a subpopulation of animals where um, either medical management has not worked or medical management is a, a real a logistical challenge for owners. And so uh, we probably do um, more of these than a lot of places. And that's probably also because our medicine group uh, especially Stan Marks and his GI group see a lot of referrals for these, and so we get uh, we get them secondarily in those cases where they those guys feel like medical management is either not working or is is difficult for the owners. So this is mainly a canine condition. I'm not really going to talk about cats a whole lot. There there was a paper written by Heidi Phillips recently on cats that we contributed some cases to, um, but um, uh, I'm mainly going to talk about the canine condition because it is something that is very very common and cats are sort of a very occasional diagnosis. And it's important to remember with dogs that they have actually a pretty lax, a naturally lax lower esophageal sphincter, much laxer than in humans. And some gastroesophageal reflux is actually can be a normal finding in a normal dog that's not clinically affected. Um, so remember that when you're looking at these, uh, these patients. And remember also that the lower esophageal sphincter is not actually a true um, uh, tightening of the lower esophagus completely different from the ileocecolic sphincter where if you take down if you take a dog down to the cadaver room the necropsy room you know there's a physical narrowing of the ileocecolic valve um, the lower esophageal sphincter there's nothing to see at all in the cadaver room okay so if you look at that specimen on the bottom left uh, that's just a 
uh, um, a necropsy specimen um, with a catheter going through the lower esophagus and there's nothing to be seen there. It's an open tube. That sphincter is purely formed by the muscular tension within the wall of that um, esophagus uh, in the live patient. And what we're talking about here mainly is the, the treatment of sliding hiatal hernias. So on the human side, you know, they have this uh, categorization, uh, uh, type one, type two, type three, type four, and we certainly do see the other types, but they're rare, okay? Gastroesophageal hernia is sort of a different entity, which I'm not gonna talk about too much. I'm mainly gonna talk about this type one sliding situation. And this is why it's a difficult thing to study because it's difficult to image, we have a very dynamic situation where that stomach is moving in and out intermittently. Um, and our diagnostic uh, tests are challenging for this disease. And monitoring of our clinical signs is also pretty challenging because it's something where um, uh, dogs might be affected for a period of time. Uh, they might be obviously affected and produce regurgitant puddles or reflux puddles on the floor of the house or on the carpet. And in some of those cases, they might uh, it might be something that we can count and monitor and owners can tell us about. But there are a lot of dogs that just reflux into their mouth and swallow it back again. And that's why we monitor things like lip smacking quite closely because those dogs uh, often will bring it up and then you'll just see them sort of sort of swallow it back down again. And the owners don't always know what that is uh, and they don't call it regurgitation because nothing's being produced, okay? We also have another important subpopulation clinically of those dogs that just present as aspiration pneumonia cases. So we had a young, uh, a young um, brachycephalic dog that presents with repeated episodes of, brachy of uh, aspiration pneumonia, there's a good chance that that's a, a chronic hiatal hernia where that dog is intermittently aspirating. And some of those dogs, the owner will never talk about regurgitation or reflux because it's, it's a silent reflux. So it's a challenging area to study, but we have done some studies in this area in the last few years, and I'll share with you um, some of the data that we've produced, and it's all sort of imperfect data, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll share that with you towards the end of the talk. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the relationship between upper airway disease and um, the GI side of this and the reflux and the hiatal herniation, because there's definitely a link between those. Um, it's been talked about a lot and there is some experimental data which I'll show that shows really, uh, that I'll share with you, that shows really that there is um, a, a linkage between uh, narrowing and increased um, respiratory resistance in the upper airway and consequent uh, movement of the uh, cardia and lower esophagus in and out of the thorax, okay? And that's an important thing. It's been looked at, um, uh, it's been talked about a lot, but we see the ramifications of that clinically because this is mainly a disease of brachycephalic dogs, okay? So our laparoscopic hiatal hernia study, I just looked through some of the data because I'm actually writing that paper up right now, and uh, out of the 22 dogs we saw, 20 of them were brachycephalics, okay, and 13 of them were Frenchies. So it tells you, it shows you that it's very much a brachycephalic disease. I'm not saying it never occurs in other breeds, it does, but 80-90% uh, of the cases are going to be brachycephalic um, dogs, okay? So the proposed pathophysiology uh, is that upper respiratory narrowing decreases intrapleural and intraesophageal pressure. So when you're when you're struggling to breathe through a narrower airway, that causes a decrease um, uh, in pressure in the esophagus and in the thorax, and that has the effect of pulling the esophagus and stomach into the thorax, and that predisposes us to hiatal herniation and gastroesophageal reflux. So what kind of barriers do the body, does the body have normally, physiologically, to prevent this from happening? And, and this is, again, a complicated anatomical area, and there's several components involved. So the LES itself is that area in the distal esophagus that has increased muscular tone compared to the rest of the esophagus. And uh, my sort of reading of the literature and my experience from these clinical cases is that um, this whole disease syndrome is not necessarily a primary disease of the sphincter muscle. I think a lot of these dogs have a relatively normal sphincter. Um, I think this is more of an axial motion disease. And what happens is over time, the barrier function of the LES is overcome because of the loss of uh, the barrier function uh, from the anatomical structures that limit um, uh, that limit motion in and out of the chest. So what we have here uh, that normally prevents the stomach from entering into the thorax is we have a phrenoesophageal ligament that attaches the esophagus to the diaphragm, okay? You can see that on the image um, below, okay? And then we have this flap valve mechanism, which is much better um, described in people and of course may not be um, uh, exactly similar uh, in dogs, but that's formed up of that ligament and also the supporting crural musculature around the hiatus. And that, that supporting crural musculature 
musculature is going to form the basis of a lot of our surgical repair. So it's important to remember that. And I'll show you pictures of that as we go through uh, the surgical videos. Okay. Um, but basically what, what uh, if you look in the human literature, it's interesting because there's a, there's a major recognition in the human side um, that what normally happens during a swallowing phase is that, and I wish I could go to my pointer here, maybe I'll just come out of the main screen here, I think you guys can still see this, but as swallowing occurs, the esophagus contracts and the gastroesophageal um, junction moves up, which opens the, the flap valve. Okay, um, and what happens is that flap, once the food is in the stomach, that flap closes by recoil of the phrenoesophageal ligaments. Uh, and normally what you get is this quite acute angle, the, what's called the angle of hiss between the stomach and the esophagus like this. Okay, now what happens over time um, is that the ligamentous support of the phrenoesophageal ligament is lost. And what happens is the angle of hiss widens such that that flap valve effect uh, goes away and it's easier for food in the stomach to move um, up into the esophagus and remember that stomach is full of ga uh, full of acid and that causes esophagitis and so on um, and eventually uh, what happens is we completely overcome uh, the uh, barrier function there completely uh, and the stomach starts to move through as that decrease in intrapleural and intraesophageal um, pressure takes hold okay and the end phase of that and that's recognized in people and we've seen that in dogs a couple of times is that you can actually get um, a situation where part of the stomach lives permanently on the thoracic side that can actually get stuck on the thoracic side and if that's a very significantly sized viscous on the thoracic side uh, in people at least that starts to be associated with signs other than just reflux uh, people get a lot of pain associated and it can, it, can, it, can, it can even incarcerate the stomach and cause necrosis of the stomach wall i've never seen that in a dog uh, but it's not impossible that that could occur all right so clinically what are we seeing in these dogs? Well, you know, you guys are probably all used to see, having clients come in and, and telling you that um, a dog produces reflux puddles uh, in the house. And that's, it's nice when that happens in some ways because you sort of can confirm your diagnosis uh, a little bit better. Now, obviously uh, you're all probably well-versed in telling the difference between regurgitation and, um, and vomiting. Some of these clients will come in um, saying that these dogs are vomiting. But the other thing we sometimes see is these dogs that just lip smack like this, you see. So this Frenchie just, just refluxed up into his mouth and now he's swallowing following that material back down again. But he hasn't actually turned into a daily chair. Okay, and that's a pretty common uh, phenomenon in these cases. Again, we also have this population of dogs that are just aspirators and never seemingly produce puddles or do a lot of lip smacking. They just bring it up and presumably every now and then they aspirate it into their lungs. Uh, and that's another subpopulation. And then we have these weird things. This is an amazing video that um, of a Frenchie that belonged to uh, one of our cardiologists actually. Um, and I've seen this a couple times now. I don't know if anybody else in the group has seen this, but this dog is uh, regurgitating uh, outside in the yard. And then it has this kind of vagal episode, what I think is probably a vagal episode that looks a lot uh, like a seizure to the owners um, and uh, loses control, collapses, uh, has some rhythmic mo uh, movements. And then that dog just got up again and walked away. And I've had a couple of clients come in um, uh, with Frenchies that do this uh, and uh, you know they're really freaking out or you get a video an iPhone video sent with uh, you know everybody in the house freaking out because they think the dog's dying uh, but I think that's what's happening in those dogs we, we initially were worried that these were neurological episodes or seizure episodes but uh, we've seen that a couple times too all right so what's the experimental evidence uh, between upper airway obstruction and GERD. Well, if you look back in the, in the experimental literature, it's pretty interesting. Most of the studies that have been done have been tracheostomy obstruction studies. So they give an animal a tracheostomy and then they, they, they produce some sort of partial obstruction of that tracheostomy so that that upper airway obstruction could be quantified uh, and measured. And so in this study, uh, a rat tracheostomy model, uh, this showed that as you, this sort of proved that theory that as you increase negative intrathoracic pressure, uh, sorry, that as you uh, progressively obstruct the upper airway, you increase negative intrathoracic pressure. So it gave some support to that theory uh, that I mentioned earlier on. And there were, there were powerful thoracoabdominal pressure gradients, um, which overcame the anti-reflux anti barrier function um, in the rats okay interestingly in the study the les pressure and the, uh, the les length were actually pretty unaffected again suggesting that at least in the early stages of the disease this is not necessarily a primary lower esophageal sphincter disease uh, this is a uh, um, an axial motion uh, disease uh, movement of that um, cardia and lower esophagus moving into the thorax and then there was a, a canine study done similar sort of thing a fenestrated tracheostomy model 
Um, uh, and uh, what that showed was that negative interest in inspiratory pressure increased um, pretty significantly one week after obstruction. Okay, so again, proving this point that there is this negative intrathoracic pressure phenomenon that's going on. And interestingly, those dogs, none of them had gastroesophageal reflux at baseline, but after a week, three out of five of them had evidence of gastroesophageal reflux. So again, lending some support that that pathophysiological theory is real in these uh, upper airway patients. What about clinical evidence in our in our veterinary literature? Well, um, you know, Lizette Hardy uh, uh, in the late 90s uh, produced this sort of uh, circumstantial evidence that uh, English bulldogs with hiatal hernias were more likely to be the more severely affected airway dogs, um, you know, suggesting some, some uh, evidence that the two might be linked. And then uh, Gilles Dupre's group, published a couple of papers looking at that link between gastrointestinal disease and upper airway uh, problems in brachycephalic dogs. And they had 73 dogs with, with BOAS that underwent endoscopic and histopathological evaluation. Um, and uh, the vast majority of these animals had endoscopic evidence of GI abnormalities and they had biopsies in a lot of those cases. And, and that's the table from that study. You can see lots of fairly non-specific findings. One thing that I think is interesting from that is that um, only three of those dogs had uh, a hiatal hernia diagnosed on endoscopy, which is almost certainly um, a significant um, underrepresentation of how many of them actually had hiatal hernias, suggesting that endoscopy is not a great um, diagnostic test for looking for the actual herniation part of the, the pathophysiology. All right, so remember that the relationship between up airway and GI surgery is a two-way street. Okay, It's well understood that if you reflux on the human side, your airway epithelium is extremely sensitive to acid. Okay, So it causes coughing, it induces mucus production, it causes uh, significant bronchoconstriction. So we always, I think a lot of people think of um, the upper airway being the cause of the GI disease and the reflux and the herniation, but the herniation and the reflux can also be uh, potentiating the upper airway signs. Okay, it's important to remember that. Uh, and Cassie Lux, who was one of our residents a few years ago, she did a nice paper, I think when she was an intern, looking at a case report of reflux potentiating upper airway disease um, in, a, in a dog. And, and uh, so that's definitely there as well. So it's, it's truly, you know, it's truly a circular pathophysiology where one is causing the other and the other is causing the, 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 the former, you know. All right, are there any questions? Um, or up till now, I wanted to, we wanted to sort of um, break every now and then and, and see if there are any questions. Dave, is there anything significant or should I move on? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and move on? Okay, sounds good. We'll do that. All right, so let's talk about diagnosis a little bit. Um, and this is where it becomes really challenging because uh, we don't have a perfect diagnostic test for this um, disease. Uh, you know, plain form radiography is not much good, okay? Obviously, we're going to do that because we want to know whether this dog has pneumonia, apart from anything else. And there may be cases where we do catch, um, where we do catch um, disease uh, on uh, actual herniation on the, the films, okay? That is possible. Um, and usually, in my experience, that is the more um, dramatic uh, uh, ones here, which in many cases are English Bulldogs, okay, uh, in my experience. Certainly you can catch these big ones in other breeds, but English Bulldogs are the ones where, uh, in my experience, the, the more dramatic ones occur, okay. Um, and uh, in studies that have looked at this, only about 6 to 26 percent of dogs that have had hiatal hernias uh, shown on, on other diagnostic imaging modalities um, are going to have a plain radiographic diagnosis of a hiatal hernia because it's just a very intermittent, very dynamic um, physiology. Uh, and so you're not going to catch it all that often on plain films. So what do we do? Well, we still do these positive contrast um, esophagrams or video fluoroscopic studies. OK, um, and this is a giant mess. OK, so here's Dr. Pollard, one of our radiologists who's, um, uh, who specializes in this area, uh, getting ready to do a study. The dog's on the table. We have to hold it down. We've got lead on, and then it sort of shakes its head, and barium goes all over the place, and the radiology techs hate this. So, uh, you know, it's not a popular study, uh, and it's not a perfect study. In humans, it's definitely known that there's a high incidence of false negatives, again, because you have that animal under the fluoroscopy unit for a short period of time, and it's an intermittent pathology. So it's a pathology that comes and goes, and we may not happen to catch it uh, under that, um, uh, under that um, one uh, short period of time that we have it in there. But our protocol generally fast the animals for 12 hours just so they're hungry, avoid sedation if possible. Uh, we try and give liquid barium. We try and administer it at least three swallows, um, and then kibble-soaked barium after that if we can. 
And there are some dogs where you just can't get these studies because they become very upset about the whole thing. Sometimes they become cyanotic or go into respiratory distress because a lot of them are uh, obviously a, a brachycephalic dogs. Um, but this is probably one of the better studies, uh, the better things we have. And in many cases, we can pick up the diagnosis. And the big advantage of, of uh, video um, fluoroscopy studies is that the animal is awake, right? So you don't have the effect of anesthesia. You have um, a more representative uh, study of physiologically what's going on in the awake dog. Uh, and this one paper I mentioned at the bottom is, is um, very interesting. It's a JSAP paper. And they took a cohort of about 30-ish dogs that were presented to a referral institution for upper airway surgery. Um, and they did uh, video fluoroscopic um, barium studies on all of these dogs. Um, and Interestingly, about 76% of the French bulldogs in the study that were admitted for upper airway surgery showed evidence of hiatal herniation on the, on the video, video fluoroscopic study. So 76% of Frenchies um, were positive on a, on a diagnostic imaging test that probably um, uh, has a significant incidence of false negative diagnosis. So to me, this paper tells me that the vast majority of Frenchies walking around today probably have reflux and hiatal herniation. OK, um, and it's debatable. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the group out of Murdoch uh, in Western Australia, um, they presented an abstract at a meeting recently where they treated a bunch of these dogs in a very interesting way. Uh, and they didn't necessarily do uh, video fluoroscopic studies on it. So th there are some people who will just go and treat these dogs surgically based on clinical signs. Um, and, uh, you know, that always makes me a little bit nervous. I like to see the pathology myself, ideally. And there are some permutations um, of those uh, pathologies that I like to know about, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, but it's uh, not unreasonable, especially in breeds like Frenchies, uh, if they come in as repeat aspirators or as regurgitators, um, you know, there's not going to be too many of those dogs that do not have an underlying hiatal hernia or reflux disease. All right, so here's what we see. Here's a sort of a classical case, uh, barium moving through, and we see intermittent movement of the stomach in and out of the thorax here, okay? So the lower esophageal sphincter is clearly uh, located within the thoracic cavity, and there are, there are periods where 50% of this stomach or so is moving uh, past the diaphragm uh, through onto the thoracic side. Right. Here's another one that's really interesting to me. This is one of those end stage um, stomachs where the stomach is completely stuck on the thoracic side. So if you watch this, boluses of food going through, coming down the esophagus, they're sitting in the fundus and that fundus never moves through or that cardia and partial part of the fundus never moves through back into its location on the other side of the diaphragm. It is stuck in that location. And we've seen a couple of dogs uh, that do that now. So again, if I see that um, in a patient, I'm gonna be more concerned about that patient. I'm probably gonna recommend surgery no matter what the clinical signs are in that patient because I don't want bad things to happen to that part of the stomach okay so again there are things on the esophagrams that will sway my decision one way or the other because I don't think this dog if he is clinical is getting is getting better with medical management alone um, potentially and or I worry that something um, more um, uh, damaging might occur to that tissue that is stuck on the thoracic side all right, so a couple more diagnostic tools that we can use. We've been playing around for a number of years now with um, a device called the EndoFlip. Um, it uses a technique called impedance planimetry. And the idea behind this device is that it gives you some real-time information about the geometry of the lower esophageal sphincter. And um, uh, again, what I've learned from using this tool, I'm not going to go into it extensively, but basically what it is, is a, a, sa a saline filled catheter that has pressure transducers um, at each end and pressure transducers within the bag. And that bag is placed down the esophagus and, and placed across the lower esophageal sphincter. And it gives you the, a readout of the, of the um, geometry of the sphincter, uh, as you can see in the bottom right hand picture there. OK, so the narrow portion is where the, the LES is centered. OK, and what we found from from the studies that we've used this on, we've done uh, some studies pre and post operatively with with this device, showing that really you don't have a great effect on the lower esophageal sphincter with this device. So pre and post operatively, the measurements are largely the same because what we what we achieve with our surgical repair is is got nothing to do with tightening the sphincter. It's got to do with trying to keep that stomach on the abdominal side. And we didn't really see a, a significant effect of tightening the sphincter. And in many of these dogs, the sphincter was quite narrow. Now you have to be careful with these measurements because a lot of anesthetic agents can affect the pressures and can affect um, the laxity. 
especially drugs like atropine, uh, cause a lot of laxity of the lower esophageal sphincter. So there's lots of different things that can affect these results. Um, but <coughs> in my experience, <coughs> Thank you, in my experience, a lot of these dogs have actually uh, relatively normal lower esophageal sphincter, at least in the early stages of the disease. So the Rolls-Royce diagnosis <coughs> for um, this pathophysiology in humans would be high resolution manometry. Okay, And this is a, uh, basically a catheter that has pressure transducers all the way down it. It's placed in the office uh, in, in the human GI centers, uh, down your throat, down your esophagus, and it gives you these very elegant readouts of esophageal pressure over time. You can look at the entire esophagus from the upper to the lower sphincter. Um, and the only problem with high resolution manometry is it's very expensive and the catheter is very delicate. And obviously we're trying to put this in in awake animals. Um, and uh, Stan Marks and I have worked a little bit with this. Stan has done some studies with this in anesthetized patients. But our experience in awake patients, especially, especially awake brachycephalics, is that it's challenging to get this down um, their nose and into their esophagus without them uh, shaking their head and breaking the catheter. And the catheter is about $10,000. So um, it's a challenging thing. And we don't have a lot of manometry data in awake dogs, but it is. Uh, ideally uh, what you would do, and it's probably what you or I would have done if we went to our uh, physician uh, with a, a major problem associated with reflux disease. All right, upper GI endoscopy, we do that in most of these patients, and what we often see are the secondary signs of esophagitis. So you can see the classic case here, a lot of thickening, um, some petechial hemorrhages down by, um, uh, down by the sphincter, basically a lot of secondary signs of esophagitis, but we don't often see overt herniation because at this point the animals are under anesthesia, uh, which su probably suppresses that movement. Um, but what we do see is the secondary signs associated with it. Um, but again, endoscopically in many of these dogs, here's that dog with really pretty bad esophagitis, but his sphincter actually looks pretty tight, right? So it's not necessarily a primary um, sphincter problem in all of these cases. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, medical management, because medical management is something we try in most of these dogs um, to start with, okay? Um, and it's uh, now the subject of a study that uh, Dr. Marx is initiating uh, with our cases here to try and figure out how, just how effective modern uh, drugs are uh, to treat the medical, um, uh, to, treat medi to treat these patients medically. The data we have for medical management is pretty lousy right now. This study from Lawrenson back in the late 90s um, is uh, the only uh, other study that looked specifically at medical management. They did a 30-day treatment course, uh, but this was even before the days of omeprazole and cisipride. So they treated with, uh, you know, things like um, H2 blockers and sucralfate and things like that. And they concluded that about half of patients had resolution of clinical signs, okay, um, uh, uh, after 30 days. Uh, and it was also a retrospective study spanning a very long period of time. So it's not great data and doesn't, they didn't have the benefit of having um, cisapride and, uh, and PPIs, which is what we tend to treat these guys with now, okay. And so we have a study under, underway to try and better characterize just how effective medical management is. So what is medical management? Weight loss, if you can do that, uh, sometimes a challenge in these little little dogs that tend to be couch potatoes. Uh, small volume, low fat meals, three or four times a day. We want that stomach not, not to fill up rapidly. We want a small amount of food to go in there so that the dog can pass it out, less likely to regurgitate. So prokinetics, usually cisapride. That's probably the most effective drug for this. It's always a bit of a challenge because sometimes it has to be compounded and it goes in and out of production. So uh, it's not always available um, in this country at least, but um, uh, we do have it at the moment. Moment, I think, and, and uh, we usually use a 0.8 to 1 milligram per kilogram per os TID kind of dosage. Okay, uh, and then we usually add in a proton pump inhibitor, usually a meprazole, um, uh, a mig per kg, Q12 hours per os, uh, usually given about 30 to 45 minutes before meals. Um, and in the hospitalized patients, um, we, we often use pantoprazole. Um, yeah, uh, perioperatively. So that's sort of our medical management protocol. Um, and uh, in many cases, we will try that and see whether we can get these clinical signs under control. And my suspicion is there's going to be a lot of dogs where we can get those medical, those um, signs under control. Uh, and so medical management will all, will, will be the only thing that's done. And if we, if we can show that, we'll probably find that our surgical caseload will go down. And that's not a bad thing. I'm okay with that. Um, the one thing that I will say is that we have categorically have do had dogs that do not respond 
um, uh, well or completely to medical management. And we have categorically had some owners, because remember, these are generally young dogs, one, two, three-year-old uh, Frenchies and English Bulldogs. Um, and the thought of giving a TID medication to, the pay to these animals for the next 12 years of their life is not terribly appetizing to the owners. And so compliance can be a big problem. Uh, owners will sometimes do it for three months and then they want to get off those meds, you know. And so we've definitely had clients who have sought medical, have sought surgical management because the prospect of um, doing that for the, for the next 12 years is not terribly appetizing to them. It doesn't fit in well with their work day or whatever it is, okay. Uh, but so Certainly, um, medical management is something we usually try first. All right, let's talk a little bit about surgery. Okay, so obviously, a lot of um, um, uh, uh, a lot of us will do these surgical the, these surgeries open, and that's where most of the literature comes from. Um, and the original surgical technique, sort of what I call triple classic triple therapy, was described in that Primac paper, which dates back to the late '80s now. Uh, and what that consisted of was uh, an esophageal hiatal reduction which is a very subjective thing. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, an esophagopexy where the um, esophagus is pexy to that uh, arch of crural muscle uh, that comes, uh, that envelops the esophagus, okay? And then a left fundic gastropexy to try and again, keep that stomach from moving, stop that axial motion in and out of the chest cavity um, and try and uh, peg that stomach within the abdomen. Uh, the wrap techniques, fundoplication techniques, there's a very, very small amount of data in that Lawrenson paper about that. Only about one in four patients responded. And I don't know of many people that are trying that. There's always concerns about over tightening that. And on the human side, certainly, it's been something where they've had a lot of different iterations of that technique. They've tried different types of wraps, full wraps, partial wraps, anterior wraps, posterior wraps, all sorts of different things, which always tells you that there's no one technique which is perfect in any one person's hands. So it's definitely a, 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 an area in, in, on the human side that is still very much uh, under debate. So the challenge of this, and anybody out there who um, has done these cases knows, is that there is a lot of subjectivity to deciding what is an over-tight hiatus. We don't want to over-tighten it, because otherwise we might prevent that dog from eructating and bringing up gas. Um, but we, uh, don't want, we, we do want to make it narrower, especially in those dogs that have a very obvious defect. Um, so what we generally do is we go in surgically and we feel that hiatus and we've, we feel the rims of the crural musculature and we bring it down in size by placing some ventral um, sutures for the most part. And that's something that, again, is very subjective. Uh, there are some dogs that have a very, very large defect and it's and it's satisfying and, and it's uh, obvious. Uh, and again, in my experience, those tend to be more the English Bulldogs. And then there are other breeds such as the Bostons and Pugs where the, the defect is less dramatic and you sort of go in there and you feel around and you sort of, you're not certain whether you're doing a whole lot. And so that's the big frustration for me uh, on these cases, knowing how tight to make these guys. So here's a video showing, it's kind of your classical situation. I think this was an English bulldog. Um, and, uh, oh, the, video, the, the mouse works when I, uh, when I have a video on, apparently. So here we can see the, the borders of the crural musculature, and we have a big defect here, right? See this right here? Uh, this is very, very slack phrenoesophageal ligament right here around it. And then we can sort of push that stomach in if we want to and sort of emulate what is probably happening during the actual hernia. Okay, so remember this when we talk about the laparoscopic approach, because it's possible, it's not impossible to break through into the thorax here, probably. We try not to do that, but it, uh, you know, the, the thoracic cavity is only a membrane away from you right here. So remember that. Here's another one uh, where a significant portion of the stomach was actually herniated into the chest. Uh, and after we get in here, there's another open case. Uh, I'm pulling this stomach out. Here's the crural musculature that we're going to do our esophagopexy to, right? That's the left cruise right there. And look at all that stomach that was living in the chest that I'm now pulling out onto the abdominal side. And that's a rather dramatic example. Most of them are not like that. Um, but uh, this one was a particularly photogenic one. So we've got to move that back into the, into the abdominal cavity. And here you can see uh, where the phrenoesophageal ligaments is and the crural muscle. And, and that's the lower esophagus, uh, proximal cardia right there. All right. So the aim of that triple therapy 
is to prevent that axial motion uh, into the thorax. Um, uh, and uh, generally, we place um, interrupted sutures to placate the diaphragm, usually ventrally, although that group from Murdoch um, um, uh, that described in the abstract, uh, placing some dorsal sutures as well. I've never done that, but it's definitely an interesting concept, and they had pretty good results. So that may be something we, we should all look at a little bit more in the future. Um, and then an esophagopexy is where we will place sutures from um, the uh, usually left crews and or right crus, although the right crural muscle is a lot uh, more intimately associated with the liver and it's pretty close to the vena cava. So I often do my, my esophagopexy just on the left crus. Um, but that's the general idea. And then we finish up with the gastropexy like this. So when you're done, um, it might look something like this with left-sided gastropexy. I make um, that gastropexy, um, I make it not super taut. We don't, I don't think there's any advantage in having a guitar string taut uh, stomach in your abdomen, but we want to make that fairly snug because obviously the whole point of this is to keep that fundus in the abdomen and not allow this area of the stomach to herniate. Here's our esophageal closure and here's our esophagopexy. Okay. And I might be able to show you that a little bit better in the laparoscopic slides that I have in a second. All right. So what I wanted to know, I had a hard time because I, I um, you know, I didn't know what to tell my owners about the success of this. We were seeing more and more of these Frenchies, probably, probably with the advent of uh, how popular Frenchies became, we were seeing more and more of these. And so I decided to do a, pros a prospective study. <laughs> and at the time, I wanted to do these laparoscopically, but I sort of decided to do a cohort of cases open because I wanted to know what the success of open surgery was, because really the literature had almost nothing in it at that time. So uh, the objectives of this study, which we published in Vet Surge a couple of years ago, was to evaluate response to open surgical management. Um, and what we did, we, our outcome measures were a standardized clinical scoring system uh, uh, that we called, it was a questionnaire essentially that we called the, the clinical dysphagia assessment um, score or CDAT, uh, which Dr. Marx uh, um, made up for us based on his experience. Uh, and then we did fluor video fluoroscopic studies pre and post operatively whenever we could get dogs back. And then we did this impedance planimetry intraoperatively before and after the surgery to see whether we were doing anything to lower esophageal sphincter. And the hypothesis was that, you know, we would diminish the signs and hopefully the evidence fluoroscopically of, of um, of herniation and, and reflux. Um, and we wanted to look at the geometry of the LES at the same time. So um, we did uh, the questionnaires before surgery. And then, you know, whenever we could get these guys back, it was about two to six months. Uh, that was the range. Um, we enrolled 17 dogs um, and we didn't find any differences in the impedance planimetry measurements, suggesting that amelioration uh, if it was seen in any animal, was due to a mechanism that was independent of LES attenuation. So when you do the surgery, you're not, unless you go nuts, you're not squishing the LES, you're not physically narrowing the LES. And that's probably a good thing, because I'm not sure we want to we want to disturb the function, the physiological function of the LES. I think it's it would be arrogant of us to think that we could do a better job than nature does of, of, um, uh, of managing the, the sphincter. Um, so for me, this is not a a process that is trying to squeeze the sphincter. It's a process that's trying to peg that cardia, lower esophagus and fundus in the abdominal cavity. All right, and what we found, and, and I don't, I'm not showing you all the results of the study, but um, most of the dogs improved clinically. So eight out of 10 dogs where it was present, um, regurgitation with eating improved, regurgitation with exercise um, improved in most of the dogs, although that wasn't clinic, um, statistically significant. As you can see, we only had 17 dogs. Um, and what you see on the graph below is that, you know, the black columns, which are preoperative and the gray columns, which are postoperative, we see improvements in a lot of those different parameters, but the gray columns don't go down to zero, right? So these dogs are not necessarily being cured. There was one or two where the owners said they were cured, but most of these dogs, we are getting them from this place to a place where they have less regurgitation and a better quality of life, but they are rarely normal dogs afterwards with no clinical signs associated with it. And I think if you do a prospective study like this and you actually ask that question uh, blindly or at least as close to blindly as possible to owners where they are given a questionnaire and then three months later, they presumably forgotten what their answers were to the first. And we certainly didn't show them their answers to the first questionnaire you get a pretty honest uh, assessment of what that dog's actually doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sometimes not as good as you would like it to be. I would love for those gray columns to be down to zero, but they're not. They're, they, we are, and I always say this to owners, I'm, I'm trying to get your dog to the best place that it can be, but that is not necessarily going to be zero regurgitation or reflux. Okay. So that's what we saw on the clinical scores and on the um, uh, sulfograms or video fluoroscopic <laughs> studies. Uh, it's a sort of similar 
uh, findings. So um, Dr. Pollard made up these dysmotility, reflux, and hernia scores. Um, and for each one, she rated severity um, and frequency. And, and if you want details of that, you can go to the paper where she, she documents what she uh, called um, a high or a low score. Uh, and again, what we found was that preoperatively to postoperatively, we generally saw improvements, but again, those gray columns don't fall to zero. And so you must not be distraught if you do an esophagram of one of your hiatal hernias and there's still a little evidence of hiatal herniation uh, because that happens to me on not uh, an infrequent basis. And what it shows you is this is not a perfect surgery. Okay, so again, getting these dogs to the best place they can be, but it's not necessarily getting them to be a, a greyhound or a, a dog that um, would rarely have a hernia or a reflux related uh, problem. Okay. All right, so what about that theory that if we do upper airway surgery on these dogs, we can get rid of the GI signs? So it's a nice theory, and every time I hear a nice theory in veterinary medicine, I'm always tempted to test the theory, right? Um, so, uh, you know, this is something that people have talked about a lot. Forget about the GI side of things. You know, you fix the upper airway and, um, and um, uh, you know, everything else will get better. And, and that's something that I wanted to look into. And we've got a little bit of data on that. We haven't finished that study yet. But, uh, and of course, in the meantime, the treatment of brachycephalic dogs has, has, gone, has gone on leaps and bounds. And any of you that were in uh, the soft tissue meeting recently, uh, people like Dr. Ladlow in Cambridge and Bryden Stanley and, and Dr. Uchtering and those guys, uh, a lot of the work has been done in Europe, um, have made really leaps and bounds in outcome assessment of these brachycephalic dogs, new techniques, you know, we now now have the folded flat palatoplasty that Dr. Dupre um, uh, um, described. So there's a lot of, that has changed. And so uh, the study that we've done is, a, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily um, incorporate all of those changes because I started it five or six years ago. But I wanted to investigate whether these dogs truly get better when you do upper airway surgery. And, and there's a little bit written about this. You know, there was this study by Laquandra from France a number of years ago um, that sort of suggested that um, import, improvement in GI signs in brachycephalic dogs will be will occur if you do upper airway surgery and uh, a quote from that is that 19 out of 20 dogs that had upper airway surgery showed marked improvement in digestive abnormalities confirmed by control endoscopy um, and again endoscopy for me is not a great way to assess these dogs because the signs are very subjective and in many cases the signs are pretty mild you know they might be mild signs of, of esophagitis but it's uh, it's often not nearly as dramatic as the video I showed you of the upper uh, GI study uh, a few slides ago. Uh, and they did note that four out of five of their English bulldogs showed persistence of hiatal hernia. Um, so anyway, we've done a study, we've accumulated a few cases, I think I might be up to 17 or 18 cases now. It's taken quite a number of years because I've tried to um, be strict about including brachycephalic dogs that are, that haven't had an airway surgery before that are severe enough to warrant airway surgery and that also have a demonstrated hiatal hernia or reflux disease, um, but uh, are not severe enough to warrant surgery for the actual hernia at the time. And there are some owners that have not entered this study because they wanted to have the hernia surgery done at the same time, get it all over with, uh, you know, those kind of things. So anyway, uh, to summarize very, very briefly, and I haven't done statistical analysis on any of this yet, but to summarize briefly, um, these are some of those um, uh, questionnaire results from these studies, okay? So mainly English and French Bulldogs. And all the green ones are favorable and all the red ones are deteriorations and the gray ones are static. So uh, when we did, so these are animals that have not had hiatal hernia surgery. They are brachycephalic dogs that have had airway surgery no hiatal hernia surgery, and they come back again afterwards, and we ask them the same questions, and we do esophagrams again afterwards. And you can see that most of the results agree, right? So most of them did respond, it seemed like. Now, again, it's not a totally clean study, okay? Some of these dogs are on medical management, some of them aren't. You know, it's difficult to control all of these factors in these studies, but for the most part, a positive clinical response, okay? Now, what about the esophagrams? It's a different story on the esophagrams. The vast majority of the, these dogs still have hiatal hernias. And I haven't had Dr. Pollard read all of these esophagrams again, so it'll be really interesting to see what the data shows on her scoring system when we, we, when we give her those studies blinded. But these are just from the radiology reports. 
the vast majority of these dogs that had hiatal hernias before surgery for airway uh, also have hiatal hernias post-operatively. So, so I think we're under an illusion that if we think that everything GI related with brachycephalic dogs is going to be fixed by doing upper airway surgery. Okay, so that's sort of um, a, the quick and dirty on, on sort of that part of the study. All right, any questions um, so far before we move into the minimally invasive? Everybody's probably sitting there going, God, when's he going to start talking about laparoscopy? Um, yeah, uh, anything real, up there? yeah, real quickly, we have a couple of questions. I think you've answered most of those. One okay. was, do you recommend surgery if they only have... Um, uh, reflex, but no evidence of a hiatal hernia proven or documented. Yeah, that's that's the gray area, you know, and that's really a tough one because, again, some normal dogs will have a little bit of reflux, um, and I think what a lot of people will do is assume that you know there's intermittent herniation there, especially if it's a French bulldog. But usually that's going to be a call that's going to be correlated with the severity of the clinical signs. And that's certainly going to be a case where we're going to try that month of medical management probably and see what happens. Is the medical management enough to get that dog to a, a happy place where the owner's quality of life and the dog's quality of life is good enough? Uh, or are we not going to see a response to medical management and we have a, an owner who still wants to, to move forward? But that's definitely a big gray zone. In most of my studies, I've only included dogs that had demonstrable herniation because I wanted to make those cohorts kind of as, as, as um, homogeneous as possible. So I'm fortunately not a very straight answer to that question. A, a second question is that um, different positionings during esophagoscopy changes the detection rate of uh, sliding hiatal hernias. Um, yeah. what, what's your experience on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, are you talking about video fluoroscopic studies? Or? Both, and um, the question was esophagoscopy, so I wouldn't mention Yeah, those. well, Dave, you're probably better at answering that question than I am, because I am in the room sometimes when my medicine colleagues are doing the, the, the uh, endoscopy, and sometimes I'm off doing something else. So I don't, I don't, I haven't had too many conversations with internists about position of the dog under anesthesia for endoscopy causing dramatic changes, but please tell me if you feel differently. No, um, I, I would yeah, agree, but, but I think, you know, uh, uh, doing your contrast studies, I think positioning might be important. Yeah. Yeah, but from a video fluoroscopic point of view, I do think positioning is important. And, you know, I will say that, you know, with these with these uh, video fluoroscopic studies, we sort of try and get away with as much as we can, but we don't push these patients because you will, you, if you push these patients, they're getting distressed and uh, you know, they start aspirating barium and stuff like this. You, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's difficult. I mean, we, we generally do a protocol that like I described on the slide where we do the, 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 the barium slurry and then the barium soak kibble and we try and get them in lateral recumbency. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and Dr. Pollard would be a better person to describe the exact protocol that they use in radiology here. Uh, but we try and do as much as we can to show that it's happening. We sometimes put pressure on the abdomen, but that is a variable that makes, you know, the data from video fluoroscopic studies uh, difficult um, to compare exactly. And it's entirely possible that in some of these studies that, that we're working on, you know, uh, that we didn't use exactly the same positioning modality uh, from a preoperative to a postoperative study. That's possible. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. So let's move on and talk a little bit about laparoscopic repair. So again, this is very much a standard of care in humans. Okay, so if you or I had reflux surgery, the chances are we would be offered um, a laparoscopic approach. Uh, and again, like I said before, there are all sorts of different iterations of reflux surgery now on the human side. And not, they're not just laparoscopic, there are peroral uh, versions of it. There are, there's the Lynx procedure where they put a magnet device on your lower esophageal sphincter that allows boluses to pass through, but tries to prevent reflux. There's a whole bunch of different things out there. Uh, but what I wanted to do was look at whether we could at, le at least um, produce a 
classic triple therapy for hiatal herniation with the scope. Uh, so this is not reinvention. Uh, the procedure that we've been doing is not a totally new procedure. It's not a wrap procedure like you can see in the bottom right hand uh, corner, which is what they do in people and, and looks honestly utterly terrifying. If someone showed me that picture and was suggesting doing that to me, I wouldn't be excited about it. Um, that's something that maybe we look at in the future. But what I wanted to do is just see whether we could reproduce what we were doing with open surgery laparoscopically as a starting point and then gather the same data as we just did for the study on open surgery and see if we can uh, emulate those results um, using laparoscopy. So at least show that we are as good with the scope as we are with open surgery, because again, I think the, the onus is on us um, to use these evidence-based techniques to make sure that if we're offering something that sounds cool and new to the owner, that we are doing as good of a job. Because if not, if we're doing a less good job, we should just do open surgery. These are young dogs. They'll recover from open surgery um, uh, just fine. If we can offer them the advantage of a laparoscopic approach, great. Um, but if it's not as good, I wouldn't do it in my dog. So I think those are the things we need to look at. But let's talk a little bit about um, how we do this. And this procedure for me has evolved a little bit as many of these new procedures have that I've tried out in dogs. Um, you know, what, what you want to do with the OR positioning is you want that dog to be at the end of the OR table because you're going to be operating basically between the dog's um, hind limbs. So what they call in humans, the lithotomy position. And that's the way they do it in people where the operator is standing between the person's legs. Um, and it's really important to have the dog at the end of the table because if not, you're going to get very, very uncomfortable. And, you know, as I get older, I think about the ergonomics of surgery ORs and how we do procedures because, you know, if I'm in a bad position, my neck is killing me after surgery. So I think about those things probably more than I did when I was in my 30s um, because I want to be comfortable. I'm going to be doing a bunch of suturing. And when you start doing these procedures, especially if you're not, um, if you're not doing, a, haven't done a lot of intracorporeal suturing, this is going to take you a while. It's definitely going to take you longer than an open approach is. And most of the surgical times at the beginning, uh, when I started doing this, were probably two hours. Uh, I bet there are some cases that were a little over two hours. Now I, I think I'm probably uh, maybe more in the sort of 80, 90 minute range, although I haven't looked exactly at the surgical times yet. Um, but, you know, suffice to say, you're going to be in that position for a while. So make it comfortable for yourself. Um, what we're going to do with dog position is we're generally going to start in dorsal recumbency like you can see in that picture. But then as soon as we put our ports in, we're going to move that dog almost over into complete right lateral recumbency. Okay. Uh, and I'll show you why we do that. Uh, notice um, endoscopic towers at the head of the patient. So remember, always want to, that basic principle of laparoscopy, you always want to be looking from the patient to the lesion or organ you're working on to the screen in a straight line. You never want to be looking over your shoulder, behind yourself. That's going to make your hand-eye coordination much more challenging. Okay, so that's usually what the position we start in. Um, and the port position was also something that I had to work my way through on those first cases that we did. And I changed it up a couple times, but I fairly quickly um, settled on this port position. So one thing I want to at, point out is that you can see in the bottom right picture here, let me go uh, out of the, the full screen for a second. Um, these are where my incisions were. There's a post-operative image, right? So this is where my camera is, okay? So camera sub-umbilical where you almost always put your camera in for most laparoscopic procedures. I, I hate paramedian ports, so I always try and keep everything on, on the median if I can. So uh, the first instrument port for needle holder is gonna be on midline, um, maybe five, six, seven centimeters cranial to my camera port. And I'm triangulating, the big thing I had to get my head around at the beginning when I first started doing these is that I was sort of always thinking that I was, this was a procedure where I'm gonna be looking straight at the midline uh, in the cranial abdomen. It's not really like that because the hiatus, remember, is a very dorsal structure. And so really what you're doing is you're not looking straight, you're looking uh, up here at the, um, uh, at the basically the left cranial quadrant. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And so when you think about triangulation, think about triangulating around the left cranial quadrant, not around the cranial aspect um, of the abdomen. Because yes, the hiatus is there, but it's very dorsal. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to tilt this dog over. And the reason we have to tilt this dog over or into 
what is either a right lateral oblique or an almost complete lateral position uh, with the right side down um, is that we need that left lobe of the liver to flop over to the right side to get it out of the way of the hiatus. Okay, and that's critical. That's one thing that can be a big frustration uh, in the early cases and still is sometimes. So um, camera port in here, uh, my two needle holders are gonna go uh, here, so I'm triangulating around this area. I've never tried this technique with single port. Um, I find suturing through single port very, very challenging. Um, so I'm probably gonna stick with a triangulation approach to this procedure um, for the foreseeable future. It's just really tough when you don't have much triangulation through a single port um, to do a lot of suturing. Dr. Monet, who loves the sills port, probably is much better at it than I am. And I don't know if he's managed to do some of the suturing through a sills port, but I find that quite challenging. Um, all right, so that's port, port, um, port placement. So let's talk about what we do when we're in there. I've completely lost track of time, Dave, so you can tell me if I'm miles over with this. I think we're approaching an hour. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we'll try and get through these. But the first thing you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to take down the triangular ligament of the left lateral lobe. Okay, so you won't see the hiatus unless you do that. Um, this is a bit of a grainy video from earlier on. I usually do that with the J hook because I like to be able to either press against it and cauterize the triangular ligament. It's a very avascular structure. If you just cut this with scissors, probably nothing bad would happen. But I like to do it with the J hook. I can sort of hook, get my J around it. I can pull it away from the diaphragm. Obviously, just be careful because the diaph tendinous portion of the diaphragm is right in front of you. Vena cava is over here, not a million miles away, right? And then you've got all these diaphragmatic little bleeders uh, here, which if you cauterize up against those, you could run into a problem. So whatever you do for the triangular ligament, you want to pull away um, and apply your energy, making sure that your um, electrosurgical wand is not up against anything essential. So that's the first part. And once you've done that, you need to flop that liver over. Now, if you stay in dorsal recumbency, that liver is not going to flop for you. It's going to stay on that left side. And we need it to get over to the right side. So we're going to move, we're going to tilt that dog over as much as we need to for that liver to flop over. There are cases where it'll completely flop over on itself. And there are other cases where it'll just move towards the right of midline. And either way, if I can get this view, I'm happy. Okay, so I just need to be able to get the view of the hiatus. Now, this is where that triangular ligament was attached. So we've taken it down. And now we can see this dog's got a nice big defect and it's got a right cruise here and a left cruise right here. Okay, so our sutures are gonna be running across the top of this. And again, we have the same problem as we have with open surgery. What is the right size for the hiatus to be? It's highly subjective and it might be totally different for a pug versus an English bulldog versus a Frenchie. But that's the general gist. Now the criticism of, well, how do you assess the hiatus if you can't get your hands in there? Should we be doing open surgery? I don't know, I, I feel like with my instruments like this, I'm doing just as good of a job as assessing the laxity of that as I would be with my fingers in there. But if I have a case, and we did have one case in our study that uh, really didn't feel like I could feel the, the margins very well, I converted that case, not a big deal, okay? But that's sort of the process I go through trying to assess whether I've got, um, uh, whether I've got a lot of laxity or a little laxity. And I think with the, the nice thing about the scope, apart from the, the, less, the fact that it's less invasive, is that you know, we, we get a really great view of that, of that hiatus. And in open surgery, I'm sure many of you have had the experience of sort of being on your head, on, uh, that, that your head's on the side, you're working way under the rib cage. It's actually, I think, a lot more pleasant to work uh, laparoscopically on these guys. All right, so let's look at what we do here. So here we are, here we've taken proline sutures. Now, I don't know if I'm old fashioned here, but I really like the idea of non-absorbable interrupted sutures uh, closing my hiatus. These are young animals, you know, one or two years of age, and uh, I'm probably not gonna risk putting something non-absorbable in there and having that open up again over time. So for me, um, at least the hiatal plication is going to be non-absorbable interrupted proline. Um, some might um, feel like they could run a continuous suture down there that can run into the esophagoscopy, uh, sorry, the esophagopexy. And I've often thought about that, but I haven't gone to doing that because I just like the idea of this proline being here forever. Okay, so as you saw there, I think my esophago, my esophagopexy, I often initiate that as the third or the fourth suture of the hiatal closure. So I, here I've placed three proline sutures. That's pretty typical. It's usually two to four sutures, something like that. 
And now I'm starting, uh, I'm taking bites of the cruise on the left and the cruise on the right. Again, the right cruise is a little bit more difficult because it, it starts to fuse with the liver and stuff down there. And then what I do is I start running a VLOC suture and this is an absorbable. So this is the VLOC 180. Um, uh, and that's a, that's a PDS like suture. And uh, I start running a continuous down for my esophagopexy. And I, I, you could argue with me on that point. I, I've used the absorbable suture there. Maybe we should be using non-absorbable suture, I don't know. Um, but I feel like over time, that'll probably scar in position and we end up with something that looks like this, okay? And here's the gastropexy that's been done up here. All right, so here's my esophagopexy completed. That usually involves five or six bites. So here's the hiatal closure. Um, sorry, cleaning my lens. Um, and then here you can see um, esophagopexy running down here, simple continuous to the lower esophagus, and this is cardia and maybe even a couple bites into the fundus. Okay, so that's my esophagopexy. And then I go in and I, and I run, um, uh, I incise through the transversus abdominis, um, I cauterize the, the, I scarify with the cautery, the seromuscular layer of the stomach, although I must say I'm considering, and I'll show you the reason why, I'm considering making incisions again in that stomach because I have had one failure. Um, but this is the left side of gastropexy. And again, we want to make that kind of taut, but not like a guitar string taut. Okay, so um, you have to sort of, that's a very much a subjective thing. Um, but uh, nowadays I tend to do a single continuous VLOC suture um, uh, to create my gastropexy. The first four or five of these I did, I did this gastropexy lap assisted because it took me so long to do the uh, hiatal closure and the esophagopexy that I was getting frustrated and I thought it would be quicker to do the assisted technique just like Rawlings' is technique but on the left side whereas after that I just got another VLOC suture and I did everything intracorporeally sutured which is the way I prefer to do it now but that's another option if you don't if it's taking a while and you don't want it to be too long you can do a lap assisted at that point as well. All right, and this would be the completed sort of situation here. Um, gastropexy running down with a scope, looking at everything. Here's my hiatal plication. And then uh, my esophagopexy is, is down here. A little bit of um, blood you can see, um, but esophagopexy down here. And that's sort of just generally how tight I make it. Okay, so you can see there's a certain amount of tautness there, but it's not, um, it's not super tight. All right, so let's talk about the results of the study, which we have not finished analyzing, I'm afraid, so I can't give you total, total results, but uh, we've enrolled 22 dogs. Um, 21 of them were my patients. One of them was um, uh, my buddy Brad Case down in Florida did one and gave me the data from that. 20 of them were Braxophallic, 13 were Frenchies. First five cases performed with a left lap assisted gastropexy. Subsequent cases were all intracorporeally sutured left gastropexies uh, with VLOC suture. Um, one out of the 22 were converted. Um, that was a weird case that I probably should never have put the scope in, uh, but it was a golden retriever, so very atypical kind of breed. Um, and it actually had a, a dorsal pharyngeal mass that might have been playing a role in the um, in causing the hernia. And I went in and I, I there was no obvious hernia there, although there was an obvious hernia on the esophagram. And I started playing around with the hiatus and it, everything seemed very taut. And so I decided that it was one that I wanted to have my hands in there to really feel the tension and see what I could do. So I converted that case. Um, so one conversion um, and then uh, one perioperative death, uh, which I'll come to, which is very, very important to talk about because it was a tragic case. Uh, but 21 out of 22 uh, survived to discharge. So when we look at the statistics, again, I've collected the same data, the same questionnaires on as many of these dogs as possible, uh, and also done esophagrams postoperatively, again, two, three, four, five, six months, whenever I could get the owners to come back, um, do esophagrams again on these dogs, just like for the open study. Uh, notice not everybody came back, so we had two, 22 dogs enrolled, but only 18 or so made it, uh, gave me the questionnaire again, post-op, and 15 or 16, made it back for esophagrams. So uh, not every dog made it back. Um, so what we found is, you know, not dissimilar results from, and I haven't made graphs up of these yet, but not dissimilar results from the open cases. So uh, very, very statistically significant improvements in regurgitation after eating and regurgitation after exercise. And again, remember these questionnaires are given to the owners uh, um, sort of reasonably blindly, or at least without the owners knowing what they wrote down the first time. 
time around. Uh, lip smacking was not significantly different um, from pre-op to post-op. And then looking at the, esoph uh, the esophagrams, again, improvements in most of those parameters, but the only one that was uh, significantly improved statistically was uh, hernia severity score. Uh, reflux severity score was almost statistically significant at 0 0.06, but it is very interesting that, and it was the same with the open cohort, that the severity of the hernia and the reflux seems to improve, but the frequency uh, is still there. Um, so again, I think uh, I'm sort of interpreting this data and we will, we will actually take the two data sets and do a direct comparison of open versus laparoscopic. I suspect we're not gonna find any big changes, but Dr. Jafrida, um, who's my wonderful statistician, is, um, uh, has not uh, gotten around to doing those analyses yet. So we'll, we'll hopefully have that data in time, um, but um, we'll see whether there's any differences. But the, my read on this data is that we're, we're probably achieving fairly similar uh, results between the laparoscopic and the open approach, which is not surprising because it's a very similar procedure it's just one is minimally invasive and the other is um, an open procedure um, complications very important to talk about so most of the minor uh, you know it's busy in there right these are seven eight nine ten eleven kilogram dogs you've got needle holders you've got needles so um, most of the minor complications were associated with um, slight lacerations of liver and spleen uh, none of those required conversion or anything none of them re required uh, blood transfusions or anything major like that they were mainly just nicks against the liver or the spleen with a needle and a little bit of bleeding. It's frustrating when it happens, but it doesn't make much of a difference to the patient. Now, our one big complication, French Bulldog, um, where I started the procedure, started doing my sutures in the hiatus for plication, and that dog, um, we, we initially developed um, some arrhythmias on the anesthesia, and then I noticed a little bit of billowing of the uh, diaphragm, and it became pretty obvious that the dog had a little bit of a pneumo, and that progressed very quickly, and within probably 30 seconds or a minute or two, uh, the dog had arrested. Um, so be very careful about this. Uh, I think what happened in this dog was that probably somehow the insufflation gas uh, worked its way through that hiatus somehow and got onto the thoracic side and that dog did not tolerate that and arrested and we tried to resuscitate and we converted, we cut it, compressions could not bring that dog back. And it was incredibly tragic because it was a young French bulldog, uh, very distraught owner. And it was a big warning sign. And, and, and looking in the human literature, it's interesting because it's actually very, uh, it's actually pretty common for humans that undergo reflux surgery to develop slight pneumothoraces. Um, when I look in the human literature, there's actually a bunch of different papers on it. Um, but in almost all of the human papers, uh, the ramifications of that were very minor and they don't even usually convert them when that happens. Um, so I don't know if there's something physiologically or we just got unlucky with this dog, um, but be very careful about that. I don't do, there was nothing obvious in that dog that went wrong. We didn't lacerate the diaphragm or anything like that. Um, I didn't open the hernia, the, the hernia any more than I normally would, but we, I think we are dealing with pretty delicate membranes. Uh, and it doesn't take much for a little gap to form uh, for gas to, to move through onto the thoracic side. And so I would urge you to use the lowest possible insufflation pressures you can. Remember, we're working under the chest cavity. There's a lot of rigidity there already. There's a lot of space there already. And so you can uh, get away with often pressures of five or six millimeters of mercury in these guys, okay? Um, and what I did, that was dog uh, probably 15 or 16 of the 22. And after that, the subsequent cases I did, I took post-operative radiographs in all of them, or at least some of them, and actually picked up very mild pneumos in one or two or three. I forget exactly. I haven't looked back at them all yet um, afterwards. So it seems like similar to humans, uh, it's not uncommon for a little bit of pneumo to occur when you do these procedures. And, um, you know, I very much hope that you guys don't have the same experience as I had with that one dog, but it was a big warning sign to be careful about that. Tell your anesthesia people about it. Have them um, have them tell you whether they notice any difference in, um, in the compliance uh, or any differences in uh, heart rhythms or anything like that, because you want to notice that. Keep looking. I'm pretty paranoid now. I look at my diaphragm. You know, you're, if you're staring at the diaphragm most of the procedure anyway. So notice if it's billowing. Notice if, there's, if the lung is suddenly retracted away, because you can usually, as you guys know, you can usually see the lung through that tenderness portion of the diaphragm. So be careful about that, um, because uh, I don't want you guys to undergo the same uh, hassle. And then I had one dog that had a, a pretty dramatic, well, I wouldn't say dramatic, but, but 
uh, noticed by the owner pretty significant recurrence of the clinical signs and we um, got the dog back in and, and worked him up again and uh, he had a totally failed gastropexy. So this was a technique, uh, the technique that we wrote up with uh, Jeff Runge and Amit Singh and those guys where we did a single suture, incised the transversus, uh, scarified the stomach, and there was no gastropexy to be seen when we went into this dog. I decided to go back into this dog open because I, I figured there would be a lot of scar tissue and so on and so forth. Um, and you can see here's my abdominal wall right here. Uh, with no sign of stomach attached to it, but we can still see some scar formation. And here's my area of the stomach with some scar on it and stuff, but clearly not attached to the abdominal wall anymore. So uh, again, uh, that was a frustrating one. We redid the surgery essentially. Um, and uh, again, that's something uh, to look out for. And that is all that I have. And I apologize for going 10 minutes over uh, because this was supposed to finish on the hour, but um, be happy to answer any questions. And, uh, and entertain any comments. Yeah, <clears throat> great stuff, uh, Phil, that's really great. Um, have a couple of quick questions that maybe you can answer. One is, what about the role of CT in the di as a diagnostic tool? Yeah, I don't have much to tell you about that, Dave. We have not incorporated CT into uh, really any of our dogs. I mean, again, it's it's um, there was an interesting study recently looking at the size of the hiatus on CT. Um, not sure if that's published yet, but I I came across that and and uh, you know showed that um, the hiatus is significantly larger in uh, dogs that are affected. Uh, and brachycephalic dogs especially. Um, so there may be some information to be gleaned from it, but for me, this is a very dynamic pathology. And so we need a dynamic study to really document it if we wanna document it. Because again, there are people who will treat based on clinical signs alone. But I have not, we have not really used CT much in the investigation of these cases. Uh, another question is, um, do you routinely endoscope these patients before and then after surgery to look at their LES and, and so forth. Yeah, so we, we have been doing that principally because it's an aid to placement of that endo flip, that impedance uh, manometry, uh, sorry, impedance planimetry catheter um, sort of requires um, uh, upper GI endoscopy. Well, it doesn't require it, but it certainly aids it um, uh, in placement um, of, uh, of the device. So we have been scoping most of them. Honestly, uh, and Stan is on the talk, I think. He's making some comments in the question. Stan, you can chime in here. I, I'm, I gotta say, I'm underwhelmed with endoscopy in these cases. And again, I am not always in the room when, um, when Stan and his group are doing these studies. Um, you know, we certainly see the, the changes endoscopically that um, Gilles' group described, certainly. Um, you know, I think there's plenty of evidence of esophagitis and so on but I have not seen a ton of videos of an obvious um, hernia reflux, um, uh, you know, and uh, so for me, uh, it is an important part of the equation, but um, it's underwhelming in some cases anyway. Another question is, are these dogs treated medically post-op and then for how long? Yeah, so one of the important things, I really should have put that on one of the slides is that, my experience with these guys <laughs> is that they're often worse after surgery in the first few days. Um, and I warn, that's part of my preoperative spiel to owners. I warn them about that because I've had a couple of owners who have taken their dogs home, you know, the day after or a couple of days after, and they're like, oh my God, what the hell happened? You know, he's regurgitating up a storm and what have you. And so, um, you know, I think what happens is they're under anesthesia for a while, uh, sphincters lax, acid from the stomach goes up there, you know, uh, potentiates the esophagitis, makes the clinical signs worse. So I would urge you to be, uh, everybody to be pretty proactive. Usually we give them preoperative um, pantoprazole, sometimes serenia, and they go home usually on medical management. And then we, usually what we do is we try and wean them off, um, you know, over two to four weeks, something like that, and see what they're like after that and see if, you know, and then titrate the meds uh, to what the patient is doing. And it's, it's true that there are um, some dogs out there that don't do as well as they could just with surgery. And we have some dogs that um, have surgery, but also stay on some degree of medical management. And that's the best place that they can be at. And then we have many dogs that are not on medical management. And it's probably a biased population because often the owners that go to surgery are the owners that 
couldn't deal with medical management anyway. Um, so it may be a little bit biased, but it is, it is true that there are some dogs out there that the best, to get the best result that that dog can have quality of life wise is surgery plus medical management. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Stan, Stan Marks is also live. So Stan, you want to make a comment about uh, your positioning and some of the stuff you are doing at Davis? Yeah, sure, Dave. Thank you. Can you guys hear me clearly? Yeah, we can. Thank you, David. Yeah, yeah great job, Phil. Um, you know, this is a really controversial issue, um, video fluoroscopy, and not just because of its utility and because the hiatal hernias are so dynamic and occur intermittently and unpredictably, but also the notion of body position is really, really important. And it does make perfect sense to try and maintain patients in a more normal body position. So a dog would be sitting or standing when feasible, in particular, just to try and reduce the frequency of inadvertent aspiration and potential subsequent pneumonia. But, you know, when we've looked at this um, more objectively um, in a cohort of healthy non-dysphagic dogs, looking at a variety of oropharyngeal, esophageal and gastroesophageal parameters, uh, including GUR and hiatal herniation, the impact of keeping dogs um, in lateral recumbency versus the same dog um, maintained in sternal recumbency did not have any impact on the frequency of GUR or evidence of hiatal hernia. So this was in um, 15 healthy non-dysphagic dogs that were randomized to be studied in both body positions, uh, lateral or sternal recumbency respectively. We currently are actually performing a study now looking at that same question in dysphagic patients. So it's important to look at it now in the, in the patients of interest, obviously. But I, I do expect that we may well find differences in oropharyngeal transit times. We will find differences in the frequency of primary esophageal peristalsis and esophageal transit time specifically um, when looking at those two positions. But I would be a little bit more surprised if body position did in fact have an impact, a significant impact at least on the frequency of, of GUR or apparent uh, hiatal herniation. Um, you know, getting back to Phil's point about medical management, I think it's a really important one. And I do think that it's probably a combination of both medical and surgical intervention that's gonna give us the best possible outcome in his patients. But as all of us are acutely aware, the notion of maintaining a dog on PPIs, you know, for, for years is not a very appetizing one. And, you know, embarrassingly, there have not been any real comprehensive long-term studies looking at the outcome of, of our patients, canine and feline, um, that have been maintained on PPIs. And in fact, Katie Tolbert's work in the CAT you know, only looked at these animals on PPIs for less than three months. And we are talking about patients that would need to be on these drugs for years, potentially. And, and so I try, um, you know, I try and assess the response of these patients over the course of four to six weeks. The esophagitis, you know, can take a while to completely resolve with the advent of PPIs. And the cisapride unequivocally plays a significant role in these patients. And so we may be able to get these patients weaned off their PPIs over the course of four to six weeks, and then they can be maintained on cisapride. And as Phil mentioned, our protocol is currently giving cisapride TID. However, if an owner, you know, because of work circumstances or some other reason cannot dose that patient three times a day, then we certainly will go to BID and critically or objectively assess any differences in the patient's response. Metoclopramide is a hopeless and ineffective drug in, in my experience, and many of, I think, us who are gastroenterologists would agree with that notion. And cisapride um, does appear to be vastly superior to metoclopramide, um, both in a clinical uh, setting and also when looking at manometry, and uh, it's, you know, impact from the advent of metoclopramide versus cisapride. So Dave, getting back to your last quick question, body positioning is being looked at in dysphagic patients. We are, we are currently um, enrolling patients with confirmed hiatal hernias for a medical management study. 
we are trying to look more objectively at um, facial confirmation. Um, there's been a lot of really nice work that's been published out of the UK looking at uh, confirmation in these dogs as well and its association with Boaz. And I think we've got a long way to go in that realm. And from the last point of endoscopy or esophagoscopy, I think part of the challenge for many of us is the inherent variability that you can see with distension of the stomach with gas or with air. And so I think it's a bit of an acquired skill um, or trait to be able to assess these hiatal hernias doing a J maneuver um, in the stomach, looking back up at the cardia. And what you're trying to look at is the distance or the separation between the GEJ and the LES. And anything greater than two centimeters would be deemed significant um, in this particular regard. And that does need to be looked at uh, more objectively as well. Yeah, um, thanks, Dan. You know, I think um, the hour is getting a little bit long. Yep. I'll stop. We'll have to have you come back and uh, do uh, endoscopy of the esophagus in the very near future. Should it? Um, yeah, okay. So anyway, um, this was a great webinar. Uh, thanks a lot, Phil, for doing this. Um, next week, we will be joined by Dr. Linnell Johnson, another UC Davis person, who will be talking about bronchoscopic uh, tips and tricks. And so um, that should be really exciting to hear her talk about that. And that will be next Wednesday, July 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's New York time. Otherwise, wishing everybody uh, good health, and we're looking forward to seeing you all uh, next week. So thanks a lot.